Welcome back to our series about ASP8266 Wi-Fi module. In previous videos we have covered a lot of practical examples with this ESP development board. But in this video I would like to cover more details about its central part, which is ESP12E module. You might ask the question, what's the reason to use this lightweight version of ESP module while VMOS development board already have all necessary stuff such as USB to serial converter, 3.3V power supply and others. So the answer is simple, it is price. VMOS development board might cost you around $2, while ESP12 e module you can get just for $1. This way, if you are planning to make some cheap mass production for your project, then definitely SP12E, either SP12F is your choice. And here I would like to solve the first challenge. This module basically doesn't fit into breadboard to make simple testing. This way I will design special adapter board using keycap. This adapter PCB will have pins with standard pinch size of 2.54 mm, so it will be pluggable into classic breadboard. There are multiple existing solutions on the market already, but I have found them not very useful. As you can see in this example, once this adapter is plugged to the breadboard, you no longer have any access to put your wires. Also, I have ordered here a few additional ESP modules, just to try to build sample Wi-Fi client-server application. So, I will be showing corresponding demo in this video. This is the package, how it comes from AliExpress. Nothing special here. ESP modules themselves are sealed within real tape containers. And you might notice that currently there are two popular versions available on the market. One of them is ESP12E and another one is newer version, which is ESP12F. So you can use any of them with examples which I will provide in this video as footprints for these two modules are absolutely the same. In this way we'll be covering the following topics in today's video, which includes the SP adapter PCB schema and layout design in KiCad. Also we'll be covering some basic Wi-Fi client server application to demonstrate how to work with these modules. So here I have my KiCad version 5.0 and at this point I just would like to create a new project. As we have discussed, our goal is to design and fabricate adapter PCB to be able to test the SP12E module on the breadboard. The first stage which we'll be having here is a schema design and I will start with the ESP component placement. Now we need to find our module. In this list you might notice two available versions so you can pick it up accordingly. This link below will redirect you to official datasheet. Here you can find a lot of useful information. This includes footprints layout metrics, various connection schemas for different applications, and power supply reference design. So definitely I do recommend to download this document and make detailed reading on it. Back to our schema design, now let's place our ESP module. Also I have to make here some label positions adjustments. As the next step we have to find and place corresponding connectors, which will be compatible with breadboard. We'll be using generic type with 11 pins accordingly. Once connector is placed on the schema, we can use C key in order to make a copy. We have to use two of them, because of we'll need 22 pins in total. And now we have to place netlist node labels. This will help us to establish connections between ESP pins and corresponding breadboard socket connectors. I will be starting here with labels placement against the ESP module itself.
At this point we can use C key in order to duplicate corresponding node labels. This way we can establish which USP pins to which connector's pins needs to be hooked up. Also, I will be placing ground connection here. This can be defined using GND symbol. So it will go under pin number 11. And the similar way I will place power supply node, which can be defined by corresponding 3.3 volt symbol. Now we have to use wiring tool in order to connect everything together. So this way we have finished our schema design and wiring and now we have to annotate all of our components. Once annotation is done we can run design rules check. As you can notice here we have two errors. This is because of our USB power lines are not in connection with special power flag. I will try to fix it by placing direct connection between 3.3 rail and power flag. The same way I have to do it for ground line. And the power flag itself you can find in the same components list under power section. Now I just have to place this symbol on the schema and wire it accordingly. So we can run design rules check again and now we don't have any errors. The next step will require to make components associations with specific footprints. So here on the right side you can look up corresponding footprint layouts. This way we need to pick up 11 pins connector, which will be compatible with breadboard. So pinch size should be 2.54 mm. Also you might notice here that the ESP module footprint is already associated and as the final step on a schema design, we have to generate netlist file. So this file can be used in our next stage, which is PCB layout design. In order to work on a layout design, we have to use special editoring keycard. Once it is started, we have to make sure that we do define correct design rules. These restrictions usually are defined by PCB manufacturer. In case of GLC PCB, you can visit their corresponding web page. So, minimum clearance values are defined here, minimum trace width, and other restrictions. I will start with track width and clearance definitions as they are defined in MILS by GLC. This way, it will be convenient for me to set them in MILS. Now we can switch to millimeters and configure other parameters like minimum wire diameter, minimum wire drill size, and then the same wire parameters for default net class. At this point, before we'll jump into PCB design, we have to review our breadboard layout. The critical distance here will be between these two points, so our pins layout on PCB should be matched Otherwise, we will not be able to plug our adapter board into breadboard. You can measure this distance using caliper and it will match exactly 300 mils, which is a standard size for breadboards and deep package pins layout. This way I do recommend to draw PCB outline on a piece of paper. You have to use some reference point as a center of coordinates, so you would know exact X and Y positions for each corner point. Now let me set the grid size to 25 mils, and at this point we have to draw some reference to set the center of the coordinate system. I have to switch to user drawing layer to make fiducial marker. So this way will not interfere with any other fabrication layers. Here using space key you can reset coordinates against hybrid point. Then we'll need to use line tool to draw horizontal segment. 
I will establish line thickness to 1 mil for further convenience. And now we can draw the second line to establish the cross reference. The final part will be a circle. Now if you restart PCB layout editor, in this case your coordinate system will be reset. So you can zoom in into this cross and press space button to restore the coordinates. The next step will be drawing of actual PCB edges. At this moment we have to use our paper drawing and make a reference of coordinates for each corner point. So now we are ready to import our netlist file which we have created on the previous stage of schema design. And this will bring all of our components to the table. Let me pick up our USB module footprint. I will be moving this part to the left section of our PCB. And here you can make some minor positions adjustments using arrow keys. Also I have to make sure to do not place any silkscreen labels outside our PCB. Now let's move to connector footprints. While you are moving this part you might notice that certain pin is used as a reference point. So we have to place it at exact position as we have outlined in our paper design. I will be using arrow keys again to make the final position adjustments. And now I will be repeating the same process for the second connector. Accurate positioning by coordinates here will guarantee us that we'll have exact 300 mil spacing between these two connectors. <laughs> now with help of keycard built-in caliper tool, we can see that we have met our critical distance of 300 mil. As the next step we have to place additional silk screen markers. This way our PCB will have labels in place. It will make better understanding which connector pin to which corresponding ESP pin is connected. We just have to place these silk screen text captions in appropriate positions. Once all pin labels are in place, you can use 3D viewer tool to check the silk screen. As I can see here, we don't have any issues with labels positioning. Now we have finished with our components positioning, hence we can remove our coordinate center reference point. At this step we can start to make PCB tracks routing. It is not a difficult procedure, you just need to have some basic practice here. If you will have a situation when you need to route specific track through bottom layer, then you can press V button to establish wire connection. This will bring your track to bottom layer. Now you can notice that we have finished all of our tracks routing except ground and power rails and I have done it on purpose to use field zone tool instead. Let me adjust the grid size to 10 mils. This way it will be more convenient to set the field zone. The first field zone will be for 3.3 .3 power rail. Also we have to make some adjustments here just to make sure that we will meet GLC PCB requirements. So this field zone will be placed on a front copper layer. Now I have to outline this zone. Then I will repeat exactly the same procedure for ground connection. 
and it will be placed to bottom layer accordingly. Once this step is completed, we can run design rules check. So we don't have any errors, it means our ground and power rails connections have been established correctly. And this is the final look of our PCB in 3D viewer. No issues here. Now we have the final stage, so we have to generate Gerber files. On the left side here you need to select necessary layers to export. There are 9 of them to be included. I will set output folder name to Gerber's and we have to generate drill files separately. This is the only checkbox which needs to be set here and then we have to click generate drill files button. Now we have to click plot button to generate main set of Gerber files. So files generation is completed and now we can find them under Gerber's folder which we have specified previously. Let me compress them into zip file. So, for further manufacturing, you can submit this zip archive to GLCPCB website. You just have to click this quote now button and find the relevant file location. There are a lot of different YouTube videos about this GLCPCB service and how to use it, so I will not go through details here. Once uploaded, you can review top and bottom PCB layers outline. Few days later I have my PCB package delivered. So let's get it opened. Usually it comes with quite nice and robust cardboard box. No exceptions in my case. Let's check the content here. And here we are, our completed PCB, which we have designed in KiCad. Let me use this high-tech tool to unpack it. I have ordered 5 of them in total. So, pin labels positioning looks good here. Also no issues with soldering pads. Bottom layer also looks accurate here. So, the next step will be soldering. On the first step I would like to check pads positioning alignment. As you can see our ESP module can be placed here without any issues. And we will start with one single pad tinning with solder. For instance this one. So I have to apply some flux here. And then we can tin this pad. Here we have our results. This way we have tinned single pin only. And there are specific reasons for that. It will be much easier for us just to hold this PCB and melt solder on this certain pad. So our ESP module will end here completely flat. This is because of other parts will be empty without any solder. Now let me apply some flux again. At this point we are ready to solder our first pin. Now it is done. This way, as you can see, this single point have secured our module in place. Now we are ready to proceed with other pins, so as usually we need more flux again. And here we can start with soldering itself. As long as we have applied flux in advance, and our parts have a lot of it, then we can place solder to the iron tip directly and transfer it to desired location. Sometimes you can find it more convenient rather than supplying solder directly to PCB part. Once the initial stage of soldering is completed, I do finalize my soldering results. For this purpose, usually I do append extra flux here, and then I do make final touch on each of these pins. It will make connections nice and clean as a result.
Finally, we have our ESP 12E PCB soldered, so we don't have any issues with connections. All solder joints look nice and shiny. Now let me grab some pin connectors. Each section here should consist of 11 pins exactly. So this way we'll cover all 22 ESP connections. And this is the last thing which we'll need to solder to our adapter PCB. In order to hold pin section in a proper position, I will use piece of clay. And overall soldering procedure is quite trivial here. I have shown some details in my first video about ESP module introduction. So, in terms of pin soldering, I will not pay a lot of attention here to show different details. So now we have finished with first header section, all solder joints looks good here. And now we have to repeat the same procedure for the second connection. Again I have to use my piece of clay to hold everything in the correct position. Now we have finished our soldering process and all header connectors looks good here. No issues with pins alignment. The first thing which we'll need to check here is whether our adapter PCB will fit into the breadboard. So we have perfect placement here. This way no issues to use breadboard with our ESP12E module. Here I have prepared some basic connection scheme in order to run and flash our ESP module. Scheme details are also available on my website in the ESP adapter PCB download section. Under this design you have to pay additional attention to GPR number 0. As in a standard run mode it should be pulled up to high level. While if you are planning to flash application this GPR 0 pin should be pulled down to ground. All of the required connection details you can find in the ESP12 module documentation. This is the document which we have downloaded from KiCad link in the beginning of this video. Here you can refer this table, which indicates ESP pins configuration. It shows which of them needs to be pulled up, either pulled down, depends on your setup. Also you might find another useful diagram here. It indicates how the receive and transmit lines should be connected to external UR port. So the connection schema is standard here. ESP receive line should be connected to external UR transmit line. And as opposite, ESP transmit line should be connected to external receive line. So let's place our adapter board on a position. And as you might notice here, we have a reset button on breadboard. But one hardware feature is missing here. It is ESP Auto Reset circuit, which we had before on the VMOS development board. This way, flashing shell script, which I have shown in my previous video, needs to be split into two separate parts. First part is optional, it is just to erase previous content from ESP memory. And the second part is mandatory, it is used to flash actual application. Here you have to pay additional attention to these no reset extra arguments. They do indicate that you need manually reset your ESP chip just before flashing or running the application. And please do not forget about GPIO0 pin, which needs to be pulled down in case if you want to write the program. Also, it might be reasonable for you to have these two corresponding build targets defined in Eclipse. So you could manually set GPIO pin and click reset button before each necessary step.
This is the next stage we have to connect our ESP UART receive and transmit lines to external UART port. You can try to use some standard USB to serial adapter, but there is one trap here. 3.3 volt supply rail might not be powerful enough to provide sufficient amount of current. So this way USB device might be constantly rebooting while you will try to flash either to run application. And I will try to avoid such issues by using my BeagleBone Black. It has quite powerful 3.3 volt supply rail. Also it has UART port onboarded, so I will be flashing ESP application from this device. Here we have everything connected, now let's power it up. I am using second UART port on my BeagleBone, so I have made corresponding parameters adjustments on my flashing shell script. And to demonstrate the main steps in terms of how to flash application, I will try to upload our existing Blinky example. At the step number 1 you have to make sure to pull down GPIO 0. This way ESP boot mode will be switched to firmware flash option. As the second step you have to click reset button, so ESP chip will be ready to accept new firmware via UART connection. Third step will suggest to trigger corresponding make file target from Eclipse. I am using modified version here as I am triggering via BeagleBone as the proxy host. Flashing procedure itself looks similar as I have shown in my first video about USB module. Once firmware is flashed and verified, we can switch our GPIO 0 back to pull-up mode. This way our ESP module is ready to execute new application. At the final step you just have to reset ESP chip again. And this will trigger execution of uploaded example. As you can see here, our Blink application works just fine. So this concludes 4 main steps demo which you will need to follow in order to flash applications into ESP 12E module. This will be applicable if you will try to flash it with manual reset option. At this point I have prepared second adapter PCB. This way, using our breadboards, we can try to build some sample TCP client server application. Here I will use my BeagleBone Black again. This time it will power server ESP node. While client node will be powered using my custom made power supply with 3.3 volts output. It is based on MS-3117 module. So using this configuration we'll try to transfer some data chunks from client node to server node. And here I have assembled everything. This way on a server node we'll have three LEDs which will be responsible to indicate received data. While on the client node we'll use these three buttons to form one byte of data for further transfer to ESP server. Here you can refer schema details for server node. And this diagram represents client node connection details. Now let me power up my BeagleBone Black. So this way we have our server up and running. The client node I will power up using my USB power bank, so it will drive my custom A 3.3 volt supply module. At the initial stage you might notice that ESP LEDs are blinking, and later on they are ignited on a constant basis. This way blinking mode indicates that ESP Wi-Fi session is active already, but TCP connection is not established yet. And once you get LEDs constantly on, it means client server TCP socket connection has been established successfully. So once client and server are connected, we can try to click any button. As you can see here, while we are pushing specific button, we have corresponding LEDs ignited on the server's side. It works by transferring corresponding byte value with encoded information about button state. Here you can see the basic byte encoding principle. So we have three less significant bits indicating which LEDs needs to be ignited. All of the source code of this application can be found on my website from the video description. This sample project is also available on my GitHub repository. And now once we have finished all client side testing, the most interesting part is coming. So now we can just remove the client side completely. And you might ask the question, how could we send our data to server side in this case? 
The answer is simple. You can use any mobile device with Wi-Fi support for these purposes. In my particular case, I will try to use Android tablet. As the first point, we have to enable Wi-Fi module on our Android system. So, ESP server session will become visible for our tablet device. This can be checked in corresponding settings menu. And here we have our session in place. Wi-Fi session name and the password will be set exactly the same as you have specified in ESP server application. So, let me try to connect to this session. Here we have our Wi-Fi connection established successfully and it also indicates that there is no internet access. This is because of internet gateway it is not configured on ASP server side, but it will not cause any issues, as in our case TCP connection is just local. As the next step I will try to establish direct TCP connection to the server port. I will use plain telnet session for these purposes. As you can see here I already have predefined telnet connection details and a specific port. This port is also defined in our ESP server application. Moving to the next step, let me open this telnet terminal and here we can try to transfer some encoded sample bytes. It represents the similar way as it was used with ESP client node. So you can type any corresponding number and then click enter button within your terminal. As you can see here LED state has been updated accordingly. You will have exactly the same behavior if you will decide to use your mobile phone instead of tablet. So, any device can be used which support TCP data transfers and Wi-Fi connection. This concludes our video about ESP12e module introduction. I hope you have found it useful. So, thanks for watching and see you next time.